Thank you, Stefan. I'm very happy to be with everyone here, and it's it's great to be at the conference. It's always really fun, um, and productive, and exciting, and and um, very energizing with all the passionate people. Um, and it's possible because of people who spend time organizing the chairs, the committees, and and the organizer of the conference, so thanks to them. So I'm excited to talk about something that I spent a lot of time thinking about, and hopefully uh, you'll spend less time thinking about after this talk, because you'll learn a little bit here, about processing extremely large images and how we approach this problem and how we actually do it. So this is some work, um, an example based off work I'm doing worked with collaborators in Germany um, at MH Hanover, and they have some data we're going to look at that is this lung data. So very large lung data created with a scanning electron microscope, and then they shave off uh, very thin slices of this with this microscope, 50 to 100 nanometers, to create this beautiful, uh, nice high resolution data set that you can look at the airways and the vessels in, in the lung. Um, and really, that's the data, but we'd like to do some computing, some analysis on the data so we can learn things from it. We want to segment uh, where are the airways, where are the vessels from these slices of data, and eventually want to quantify uh, statistics like shape and size uh, from the vessels and we can, so we can gain some uh, biological knowledge from our imaging data. That's our, that's our goal. Uh, but we have these challenges that we run into, these practical challenges. So this data set in total for the entire volume uh, of the tissue that we're looking at is two terabytes. And none of us has a computer that actually has two terabyte RAM, or maybe you do, and, and I'm very jealous of you for that. But uh, we have this constraint that a lot of these very large data sets, when we say extremely large, we just mean larger than what we have in, in our laptop or in our our cluster available to, to process in at, at a single time. So we want to be able to process this with the limited amount of memory that we have. We also want to be able to do parallel computation. So lots of data, we need to process it in parallel effectively. And we'd also want to learn how to do this in Python because it's accessible and flexible and lovely. We all love it. So the goal is to discuss how do we do stream processing of large scientific images. This is the first approach uh, that we have for handling this uh, limited memory problem, stream processing, and how specifically do we do it with, with imaging data. So uh, what we want to do eventually is to maybe set up a processing pipeline like we have with this data, and we want to just process chunks of the data. That's what we mean by stream processing. So go through and compute chunks of the data um, incrementally, and that will allow us to limit the, the amount of memory that we are working with. And also, if we do that in parallel with different chunks, we can um, compute things faster. But the question uh, that you have is, OK, we have this big data, and we have this computation that we do. What exactly do we do? How do we approach this problem so that we are getting uh, the desired output. So we get the same output that we would get if we were um, just not, not doing streaming. And also, how do we do it that, you know, in practice, we're mi limiting memory usage um, and we're enabling parallelism, but we're doing do it in a way that it's not too complex and we're not recomputing things that we don't need to. So there is kind of a simple approach that we can take and a, and a standard formula that we can apply to this process so we can understand how do we figure out, really, the question is which blocks of data, where in these different um, points in the stream, what chunks need to be computed. So that's what we uh, want to answer today. That's the question. And this is based off experiences with this library that uh, I work on a lot. It's an open source library that's been around for a long time, 20 years. Uh, and it was first used to, to work with 3D medical images. So 20 years ago, 3D medical images, which are maybe 5, 12 cubed, that's extreme, that was extremely large, right? That was larger than things that fit into memory. And uh, nowadays, you can, you can process these with a nice, nice laptop um, in memory. 
um, unless you're doing maybe deep learning, in which case that's you know a very deep tree, requires a lot of memory. But there's also other data sets this, this applies to. Um, there's microscopy type imaging, um, lattice light sheet microscopy imaging, or there is uh, some computed tomography that is very high resolution, or satellite uh, images, or astronomy images. All these different type of images produce these very large images that we uh, need to know how to process in an effective way. So we're going to kind of take this um, design pattern um, and learn how to apply it to different data sets, but also outside of ITK to kind of the general principles here. So we're going to do this with an example problem. And that is filtering and transforming slices to create a large volume. So again, we had this data set that we acquired slices in 2D, and then we figured out the transformations to align them. And we want to maybe do some filtering to remove some noise and prevent aliasing, and then sample them along a grid so we can produce this nice uh, 3D volume in the end from the, the 2D slices. That's our goal. OK, so there's. Four steps, four steps I'm going to talk about that you can do and just fill in these four steps and you'll be able to create your analysis pipeline. Step number one is pretty simple. We just define a processing pipeline. So we set up the filters and the parameters in our pipeline, starting with simply a reader. We're going to read the file. Then we're going to do some Gaussian smoothing on the, on the data and resample the data. And the parameters to that are the spatial transformation that we need to use and where, what grid we want to create on the output. And then write the file back to disk. Some things to be aware of when we're doing this uh, setup of our pipeline is that the direction when we're figuring out a pipeline is from inputs to outputs. Um, and it's also very important to work in physical space. Uh, and this is, physical space is especially important for step two. So the step after you figure out your pipeline is we need to figure out the largest possible outputs. Um, our goal especially is to get to the end. What is the end image that we want to um, compute? So we start with the input data, and that's represented in, in this uh, grid below in, in the file on disk. Um, and then we figure out from the metadata where that input data is in physical space. What's the largest possible image that could be created from that data? And then in many cases, it's going to be a trivial operation to figure out if we do something like smoothing, it's going to have the same domain as the input data. In other cases, like when we do resampling, and we change the sampling grid or change location in space, um, this, the size and the location of the image in space might change, but we'll get an idea of, of based on these parameters for our filters, what the output is going to be, and then we're going to write that to disk. So now we have what we can create in step two. Uh, finally, uh, we come to step three, and step three is the one that starts to get maybe a little, a little trickier. So we're going to do a, um, a Intermezzo here, and this I present to you a fun maze problem. That's going to help us here. So you, you can take a look at that maze and see if you can solve it. I'll give you a few seconds. A flashback from when we were kids. So they give you the problem. Hey, start start from here, and you start down the maze, and you try going down one path, you know, dead end. And so then you try another path. Another dead end is kind of how I approach this problem. And then you kind of think, well, I'm, I really want to get over here. So I need to keep trying and see how it can get closer to the end. Uh, so I hope that was a little fun. I'm going to uh, give you, tell you the trick for working with these, these maze problems. The trick to remember for this maze problem and for doing streaming pipelines for images is start at the end and work backwards. So if we start at the end, actually, the way they set these problems up, they set it up so there's many different options when you're starting from the beginning. But when we work backwards, um, the solution is actually pretty easy to find. And uh, for streaming pipelines, um, it's similar. And kind of, kind of need to remember this, um, this approach. Start from an output chunk 
and we work backwards to figure out what input chunk we are going to use for the processing pipeline. So the next step, step three, is we've determined what our outputs are gonna be, and we chunk on the outputs and work a ba way backwards to figure out what the chunks that we need to compute are from the input. Um, this is important because let's say we try to start chunking on the input, which is maybe the intuitive thing, kind of uh, the first obvious thing that we might try. But if we try moving forward, it's to produce a certain output, there's many different options we don't really know, especially if it's a large pipeline that's complicated, where, where we should compute our data. Um, if we just kind of do it naively and just chunk everything in the input, maybe we won't produce all the output pixels, maybe we'll recompute some of the output pixels. So we start at the end of the pipeline, um, start with a chunk, and then if we want to produce that chunk in the file, that corresponds to this area in the resampled image. And then from there, we can figure out from that output in its input what chunk needs to be computed. A fun thing that we did for this project that I thought was kind of neat is that if we're, we were doing resampling with a, an affine transform, and kind of one of the neat mathematical properties of an affine transform is that it's linear, and that means really, <coughs> affine means um, creating lines and lines in space. So what you can do for this problem is just transform the corners of the affine transform to figure out its domain in space, Expand it a little bit by the domain of your interpolator. So if you have a nearest neighbor interpolator, that doesn't require any extra pixels. If you have a linear, that will require one extra pixel. If you have a, a sync function, that will require more, depending on the size of your sync. And then you can define the input chunk required there. A lot of the operations we do in imaging are convolutional type operations. So it may mean expanding the size of the chunk and the input for an output by a few pixels, and then that determines what we're gonna read from, from disk. Excellent, so now we've kind of figured out the chunks in our pipeline, which is the hardest part. Uh, one of the things, again, to keep in mind here is to work in physical space. It's very helpful to, to do the computations, uh, right? And the last step to do a streaming pipeline is just to compute the, the chunks. Starting from the input, we go to the region that we need, decided we need to compute on the reader, we compute it, we do the smoothing, then we do the resampling, and then we finally have created one chunk in the output, and then we go back again and we find another, um, starting from the back, we, we found the other set of chunks that we need to work with, and then we compute them, and we just iterate until we've completed our entire output image. That should be correct and the same as if we weren't doing streaming. <coughs> Awesome, so, we, so that's the basics right there. Um, one thing to keep in mind here, and kind of a caveat, is that if we want to avoid at one time loading the entire image data set into memory, everything needs to be able to, to do this chunk processing, including the file readers and the file writers. And not a lot of file formats support that. Um, in ITK we use in the ITK community, we use a format called MetaImage, which is pretty capable, and it can, and it can do that. Also, HTF5 is something that, that is capable of doing that, so that's a caveat to, to really be aware of. So that's the basic to-do to streaming. Another thing that we can do as an extra is to compute in parallel. So now we have this nice architecture set up, this nice pattern set up, and we can go and compute these sets of chunks independently of each other um, and write them to the output. These will all be in separate memory uh, when they're computed and they'll not overlap in the output that they're being written to. Uh, another bonus here and something to think about is that it's often desirable to do compression of your data because First of all, in practice, writing and reading files to, to disk, and for these very large data sets, it might be over the network. Um, if that's really a bottle, bottleneck. That'll take more time in many cases than actually doing the computation. 
and we have these huge data sets, and we don't have infinite money to buy many, many disks, so we can save disk space with, with compression. Uh, it's a little tricky, though, because when we go to take our output and create the, the output file in the compressed file, if we just try to use a single file, the file has to be contigu contiguous on disk. So we have the different chunks, and you want the file to have to use all the bytes available on disk, one after the other. But if we're, we don't know the size of the compressed chunk until after uh, the computation is done. So that's kind of a general uh, problem. And very neat solution that's been produced by the community recently are these chunked compressed file formats. And this helps solve the problem by separating uh, the chunks that we do into different files, writing to different files, and you don't have to worry about what the size is of the next chunk for the current, for the current file. Um, check out Zar. There's a great presentation yesterday on that. It kind of explains that. So that's for computing these streams in parallel. Another option for parallel computing is to do maybe multi-threaded CPU or GPU parallelism. And how we would do that in, the, in this framework is that when we're doing the chucking, we re-chunk it again. And when we're processing the, the output for one of these filters, we split it up again and run that on, on a thread in the CPU or GPU, compute that. So that is, um, that's the basics of the, um, the theory. In the practice, we can implement this using a library like ITK. And to do that, you would just create filters. There's filters in ITK. And you create, connect the inputs to the outputs of the filters to produce a pipeline. And we set the filter parameters. We um, set the number of chunks we want to create at the end with the number of stream divisions. Uh, at the end of the pipeline, right? So remember this maze idea that we work from the end of the pipeline. And creating those filters, defining those param parameters, that doesn't result in any computation. Computation happens when you call update at the end of the pipeline, and that's going to go through and do all those steps of determining the output, uh, determining the different chunks based on the, on, on the output, and it's also maybe going to do some multi-threading. Uh, but we can also do this with other tools in the, in the system, scikit image, or, um, and, and other tools uh, with the help of Dask. And I think John, uh, John Kirkham is going to give a nice talk in a, in a few sessions here on, on Dask, so check that out. But how would we apply this, this pattern and this process to um, analysis pipeline that's written in, in scikit image and Dask? So first we create a processing pipeline and, and use DAS delayed to wrap it. So we don't actually execute it on their data, but we use this delayed to kind of set things up um, and, and have it be set up for lazy evaluation later. And inside that pipeline, there's going to be, have to be two passes so that we can figure out the chunks that we need and, and compute them. Then we're going to need to figure out our output image that we want to compute. Um, starting with the output. And then we figure out how we want to do the chunking on the output. Um, if we have a trivial pipeline, the chunk will be the same as the input, but in many cases when we're resampling and doing other things, the chunking can, can be different on the output. Then, uh, again, this czar format is, is available in DAS, so you have this complete pipeline of streaming from the input into the output if using this to czar function. Um, and, and DAS can help you ex execute the streams in parallel. So coming back to our original problem, which was how do we process these large scientific images? You know, we have this task, not using up all our memory, doing things in parallel, doing th things in Python. Uh, this is the approach that we can use. So uh, to recap, we start by defining our processing pipeline with the filters and parameters, then determining what kind of outputs we can get. Then we find the required chunks starting from the output, moving back into the stream, and then we just sequentially go through and process the streams in the pipeline. Um, so the, these slides are available for reference with this um, link on the left, and also there's, there's a tutorial um, for getting started with some streaming 
um, in a Jupyter notebook if, you, if you're interested in that too. So I think we have some time for questions, yes? Good. Thank you, Matt. Hi, thanks. Thanks for the talk, great presentation. Um, we also work with um, block processing in parallel, and we work in instant segmentation, and we have the problem that we don't know, well, we can't consistently merge blocks, or we can't guarantee consistency, we just do it in a way. Do you have a good solution for that? Yes, yeah, so the question is about, um, in some cases where you're doing a segmentation and, and things don't uh, consistently, uh, you can't really do, they're not independent, of uh, the different blocks, and maybe you want to resolve the, the result at the end, and it's sort of an open problem. There's no one solution. Uh, the basic solution, if you're doing a segmentation and you segmented and identified structures in one chunk, and then you have another chunk, and hopefully you do some overlap in an overlapping region. The simplest solution is just to do voting. Um, if you have classification and there's voting uh, filters, and that, that'd be the first um, place to start. Um, and or, you know, voting or a intersection or union policy, depending on your segmentation algorithm and your data and what you'd like to see. Any more questions for Matt? All right, then let's thank the speaker again.